Read tonight from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 5. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and from verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. A certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Amen. May God bless the reading of this word to us. Let's turn to uh, Mark's Gospel again, chapter 5, and this account of the raising of Jairus' daughter. Mark's Gospel begins with the words, the beginning of the Gospel, about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And his purpose in writing is to tell us about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, And the stories that he records are intended to help us understand who Jesus is and what he came into the world to do. Uh, The miracle we're looking at tonight is the last of a series of great miracles that Mark records for us, beginning in the last section of chapter 4 through to the close of chapter 5. He records four episodes, each of which, which is intended to show to us the supreme authority of Jesus Christ, mighty Miracles that demonstrate to us the supremacy of Jesus over all things, particularly the malevolent forces that have blighted human existence almost from the beginning. So from Mark chapter 4, verse 35, he takes us through a series of events, accurately reporting to us what happened. He tells us first about Jesus' authority over creation and physical dangers that is demonstrated in the way in which he stilled the storm on the sea. And then he demonstrates his dominion and his supremacy over demons in that incident in the Gadarenes recorded at the beginning of chapter 5. And then his supremacy over disease was seen in the way he healed that woman who had suffered an issue of blood for 12 years. And now finally we see his authority even over death itself by the raising of Jairus' daughter. A series of astonishing events that is intended to demonstrate how gloriously sufficient and adequate Jesus is as our Savior. Now, the healing of Jairus' daughter 
took place over a period of time, as you see in the text. It involved a journey to the man's home, and on that journey, Jesus meets this anonymous woman who was very sick, and he heals her, and he speaks with her before turning to carry on to the home of the sick girl. And the way Mark tells the story is by placing one incident, as it were, inside another. Some commentators refer to this as a Markan sandwich. It's put together so that the flavor, as it were, of the out, outer story adds zest to the inner story, and the inner one is meant to permeate the outer one so that they color each other and flavor each other. So the two miracles are part of the same event, and we're intended to relate them together as, as we deal with them separately. They are both about people struggling with sickness and hope and how Christ delivers us from one to the other. And Mark's intention is that you should see yourself, as it were, as part of the large crowd that greets Jesus as he gets off the boat in Galilee in verse 21, and you listen to the frantic plea of this desperate father of a sick girl. You take the journey with Jesus you see the events as they unfold before you, and you see the relevance of that to your life and to this congregation and the people you know. What can the living Son of God do for them? He restores and he will restore the life of his people. That's what Mark wants us to learn from these two great stories. Now, the first thing we see here is how Jesus encourages faith how he encourages our faith. He returns to Galilee, verse 21, and immediately he's welcomed and he's wanted. A great crowd gathers. And then one of the rulers of the synagogue comes, named Jairus. And seeing Jesus, he falls at his feet and he pleads earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand on her that she may be healed and live. Obviously, this man then has heard about the power of Jesus. He may have observed him, but he had certainly heard about him, or he wouldn't have come looking for him. And he had probably heard of the controversy that had broken out in all the synagogues wherever Jesus had gone and taught. And so men in his position wouldn't have been overjoyed to see Jesus turn up at their synagogue to worship on the Sabbath day. I wonder if this man had thought about what would what he would do if Jesus ever turned up, if he walked through the door of his synagogue. Would, would he see him entering and taking him, take him aside, perhaps, and say, um, I don't particularly want you to say anything here today. Maybe he thought Jesus would never bother visiting a little place like his anyway, and so he could just sit on the fence and say, well, I don't have to get involved. This just isn't going to touch me. Whatever the truth may be, something happens that forces this man into meeting with Jesus, his only daughter, his darling daughter, 12 years of age, is sick, and none of the homespun remedies are effective in treating her. None of the local doctors can prevent her getting worse under this sickness. She's obviously dying. The whole household and the neighbors and the congregation of the synagogue, they're all grieving. They see hope slipping away from her. Jairus casts a panicking glance at his wife, no doubt, and she wrings her hands in fear. And then he hears that this boat carrying Jesus has just landed on the shore of their town, and Jesus is there. So it's no longer a theoretical matter now for this man. What would he do if he ever met Jesus? His daughter is dying, and Christ is there. No one can help her, but Christ is there. His heart is breaking, but Christ is there. And so he comes off the fence. Who, who's bothered now about religious and political controversy? When your only daughter's dying, those things just don't matter to you. When death comes nearer and nearer to us and it's a race against time, we're all in that race, aren't we? Though most of the time we're not really conscious of it. But when that happens, these other things pale into insignificance for us. So he hurries to the lakeside, and seeing Jesus, he falls at his feet, and he begs him earnestly, my little daughter is dying. This ruler of the synagogue prostrates himself at the feet of Jesus, 
At this point, he couldn't care less what other people in the synagogue would say on the next Sabbath or what the other rulers of other synagogues might think about him. Death has invaded his house. No one can resist it. But Jesus is here. And he must have Jesus' help. Of course, there's a sense in which you and I are in the same position as this man. Though we're not usually aware of it. Because every day that passes is a day nearer my death and yours. And our exit from this world. And every day that passes is a day in which my own death inevitably draws nearer. But am I ready for that? And am I preparing for that great day? Do I have a covering for my sins? Do I have a mediator to introduce me to the judge who sits on the throne of the universe? We must prepare for that day because we can't postpone this meeting. No more than Jairus could lock the front door of his house and keep death out of his house. He couldn't do that. He was earnest when death came to his home. What if it comes to your home tonight? We need to be prepared through that, through the Lord Jesus, the only Saviour. Notice how he humbles himself here. He falls at Jesus' feet. He's lying in the dust before Jesus of Nazareth. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones once preached a sermon on this text, and he says this. This is something which is found to be present invariably and without exception in the case of all those who've been blessed by Jesus Christ. The people who came to examine and test him invariably went away disappointed and confused, feeling that they themselves had been tested and examined in the very depth of their being. Those who came to trap him and entice him in his words and to get him into difficulties invariably went away confounded and condemned and hating him with bitter hatred. But those who fell at his feet who acknowledged him and his greatness, never fail to obtain a blessing. Let there be no mistake about this. If you approach him with a mere spirit of curiosity, he will not reveal himself to you. If you come to him with your own ideas and conceptions in order to judge and estimate and to try him, he will confound you by holding forth before you a standard of life that you could never hope to attain and an example and a pattern that makes your highest and noble efforts trivial and childish. Approach him as if he were a mere man amongst men, albeit the greatest and the noblest, to whom you are prepared to show great respect and deference and whose example and pattern you are prepared to follow. Approach him in any one of those ways on your feet and relying in the slightest extent on yourself and your own powers and you will never know his blessing. You may persuade yourself of many things, but you will never know what he really does to and for his own. He only blesses those who come on their knees, those who, looking at him and conscious of their own sinfulness and helplessness, realize that he is the very Son of God come on earth to deliver us. Jairus prostrates himself before Jesus. And then notice that he tells him the way that he thinks he should save his daughter. He doesn't say, my daughter is at the point of death, please help. But he spells out what he wants Jesus to do. Please come and put your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. See, just like you, uh, Jairus left his home that day with certain ideas about Jesus. Like you, he had a certain mental image, a picture of Jesus. And on that basis... Uh, he comes to Jesus and tells him what he has to do. But how small and unworthy his idea of Jesus was. It's only by listening to Jesus and submitting to him and trusting him that this man began to learn glorious truths about Jesus. And so often we're like this man, Jairus. We don't just bring our needs to Jesus, but we try to tell him the precise way in which he must meet the need. That's what this man does. Most of us here know that Jesus didn't have to go to this man's house in order to heal his daughter. He didn't have to see her even. He didn't have to touch her in order to make her live. There was once a Roman army officer who was stationed in Israel who had greater faith than this ruler 
of the synagogue. He told Jesus about his sick servant lying at home near the point of death, and he longed for him to be healed. But then he added that Jesus didn't need to go to his house in order to heal him. He said, I'm a man of authority. And uh, I say to one man, come, and to another man, go, and they jump to it. You only have to will it, he says to Jesus. You don't even have to speak a word, and my servant will be healed. What amazing faith that was. Jesus hadn't found faith like that amongst the rulers of the synagogues, let alone in their congregations, and immediately he willed that that man's servant should be restored. It only takes that, and the dead are raised. The centurion's servant was healed in a moment. Well, Jairus didn't have that faith. All he had was a great need that brought him to his knees before Jesus, pleading for his daughter to be restored to health. We have to go there right now, he says. I'll take you to her. You must put your hands on her and heal her that she lives. He thought that is invariably how healers work. So Jesus went with him, we read in verse 24. What an amazing grace that is. The Lord Jesus doesn't stop and say, now, of course, you don't tell God how to do his work, and uh, I don't even have to be there to save your daughter. There's nothing like that. Jesus went with him. In other words, when you come to Jesus for help, you don't have to get everything exactly right before he'll bother to listen to you. Your prayers can be so muddled and so mixed up and all over the place, and yet through the grace of God, he grants the desires of your heart. Jesus doesn't say you've got to get everything right before you can come to him and before he'll walk into the heartbreak and the mess of your home and your life. So do you see how he encourages us here? He went with Jairus. And he also encourages us in what he said. We're told he went into, uh, that they went to Jairus' house. Uh, he could have, if he could have, he would have made Jesus run there, I'm sure. But on their way, they meet this sick woman who touches Christ and he stops to deal with her. There are delays in answers to our prayers that come to us from God. You can imagine this man almost dancing from one foot to another. He wants Jesus to keep going, to heal his daughter. And it's at that very moment we're told that some men come from his house and Jairus recognizes them. It's his trusted servants looking for him. And he's more afraid at that moment than he's ever been in his life. Don't let it be. That's what he's thinking. Don't tell me what you've come to say. But it is that terrible news. Your daughter is dead. I hope they didn't say it like that. I hope they wept and hung their heads and whispered. We're so sorry. This terrible news. But it does read like that, doesn't it? Four horrible, hope-destroying words. And then they add, so you don't need to bother the teacher any longer. He's just heard Jesus say to this woman, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Well, here's Jairus. He's been seeking to serve God all his life. Why doesn't the Lord give him what he asks for instead of this terrible news? And then the extra barb. Don't, don't bother now. No point in pinning your hopes on Jesus. The girl is dead. There's nothing anyone can do now. Death levels the playing field for everybody. Death always has the last word. No use bringing the teacher a step further. He's as helpless in this as anybody else. Nobody can do anything now. You see, what these men are assuming, they're assuming what many people assume today, that there are situations that are beyond the scope of Jesus Christ. And they say, you've just got to face reality. You get inspiration from Jesus' teaching and encouragement from meeting with other nice religious type of people and you enjoy singing these great hymns well well I'm happy for you 
But when it comes to death, we're all helpless before it. That's the assumption of unbelief. And that's how people think when they have a little Jesus, a little view of God. Have you found yourself ever thinking like that? There's a situation in your life and it appears it's a dead end. There seems to be no way out and you're thinking that Jesus Christ can't do anything about that. It's beyond him to do it, you think. Well, that's the assumption that's working here. No one can cope with the grave. We go home, we mourn the tragedy, but there's nothing else can be done. But listen to Jesus and hear the encouragement he gives. Don't be afraid, only believe. He says to him, and the word means, go on believing. What did he mean when he said that? Don't be afraid, go on believing. Well, it's as if Jesus is saying, when you came to me, uh, your daughter was still alive. She was in grave danger, but she was still alive. And you came to me. You brought this desperate need to me. You had some belief that I could do something to help. You didn't think I was any kind of a fraud. You had faith to fall before me and to beseech me. Go on believing. Go on believing. Don't stop. Don't stop trusting me now that things have got worse. Don't let your fear win. Those fears that say death always has the last word and you'll never see her again. And Jesus is helpless. Keep fear away by going on trusting me. So Jesus goes with him. He encourages his faith both by his actions and his words. And then he does something more. He ignores what the servant said, doesn't he? By going to the man's house. The servants believe that he can't do anything. It's too late. But Jesus keeps going. And he's going to enter into this situation now. He's going to transform it. He doesn't, he doesn't stop and shake Jairus' hand and offer some sympathy and turn and go back. He doesn't say to him, if only you'd come a little earlier. Maybe I could have helped. That's not what Jesus does, is it? He keeps going in the face of the bafflement of the servants of Jairus. And his word to Jairus is, don't be afraid. Keep on trusting. That is, trust my adequacy. Believe that I can handle this as well. That's, that's what's required of any believer as we go into the various crises that we meet in life. And isn't that a word that we all need to hear? Don't be afraid. Go on believing as you walk into that darkness and into that mess. Go on believing, Jairus, that I'm adequate for something you've never had to face before, for this awful situation. I've not finished with you yet. I am adequate. And if I'm adequate when there's still hope, I'm adequate when there seems to be no hope. Don't be afraid. Just believe. It's Jesus encouraging our faith. And then notice here as well how Jesus conceals his glory. We're told that Jesus did not let anyone follow except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Verse 37. In other words, he took a restricted audience as he entered into the man's house. These three were with him on very special occasions, weren't they? They were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. They were with him closest to him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this scene now is like those, very special. Everything that Jesus Christ ever did was a revelation of God. But this is one of those extra important occasions. And the Lord wants them to be with him because in the words of Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses so here are three men who testify what John Mark uh, later was to write in this gospel they were the witnesses and this is all the more important because the crowd itself is excluded we are told that when they came to the house the ruler of the synagogue uh, was there and Jesus saw all the commotion and he saw all the people crying loudly he went in and said to them what is all this crying what is all this commotion the child isn't dead but asleep and they laugh at him they ridicule him 
And he put them all out and he takes the father and the mother and the disciples with him and he goes into where the child is. Now as most of you are already aware, professional paid whalers would hang around the homes of people who were sick and close to death, waiting for the death to be announced and then they would go in and they would be begin their loud crying and then they would pick up a few shekels later. If you really loved a dead relative, that would be judged. How you loved them would be judged by the number of mourning, mourners you hired to wail at their death. Uh, certainly in the second century, in Jerusalem, even the poorest person would have at least two flute players and one wailing woman. But Jairus was a synagogue ruler. So he would have had more than that. And Jesus walks into all that din and commotion. He commands enough attention to be heard. And he says, the child is not dead, but asleep. She sleeps. And they all fall around laughing. One minute the room is full of wailing. The next moment it's full of laughter. To them, what Jesus said was ridiculous. So they laugh. They knew that when someone was dead then they're dead. They're not sleeping. What stupidity. And so they mock and they scorn the Lord Jesus. And Jesus throws them out. Every one of them. They were all put out, it says. He put them all out. He drove them all out of that house. And now there are just seven in the room. The parents, the three disciples, the Lord Jesus, the little girl. The raising of this girl was to be witnessed only by these And they weren't to tell anyone about it. He gives strict orders, we are told, that no one should know about it. Verse 43. Well, how could they keep something like that silent? The mourners and the servants, the entire crowd that Jesus had thrown out of that house, knew that the young girl was dead. And that he had got there too late to do anything about it. But that night after supper, she was going to be out in the street playing with the other children. They were going to know something had happened. So Jesus doesn't mean when he says this, pretend that nothing has happened. What he wants is that they don't divulge any of the details of what had happened in that room. If people ask tomorrow, you're not to tell them anything. Don't say a word about what has occurred in here. But then the question is why? Why would Jesus say that? Well, there are, I think, at least two reasons. The first is that this is still very early on in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And if news of this became widespread, it would be dangerous. There would be danger from Herod. There would be danger from the religious leaders and the Sanhedrin. And Jesus is working to a particular schedule. You remember how often he spoke about his time and his hour. There was a certain order and pattern to his ministry that he was following. Uh, There were years ahead of training and teaching the twelve before he could allow the rest of the people to know that he's the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And once that is out, very soon he's murdered. The other And more telling reason for this silence, I think, is this. That there was a group of mocking people who had ridiculed him. And this revelation of God's glory was to be withheld from them. They've ridiculed him. And to that kind of unbelief, Jesus veils his glory. He will do that. He may do that with you. He tells us he reveals his glory to babes, but he hides his identity from people who think that they're clever and smart. They're never going to know. Why does Jesus withhold the details of this girl's restoration to life? It's because he doesn't want these cynical people to know about this display of his glory. When men and women persistently bring an unbelieving attitude to Jesus, he withdraws light from them. When the people in the land of the Gadarenes said to him, Go away, don't stay here any longer, he went. He could do that with you. Now you might protest and say, But I still got the Bible. But you won't see anything 
there by words without the light that only Jesus can give by shining that into your understanding. And if we come to Jesus Christ proudly and arrogantly, then he will not show himself to us. God resists the proud and shows grace to the humble. And we are completely in the dark without Jesus Christ. If we look upon Jesus Christ and his gospel as just so much stuff and nonsense, what makes you think Jesus will ever display his glory to us? He meets that kind of disdain by concealing his glory. Here's a little girl who was 12 years of age when she died. And yet there was just one person who could alter that, who could wake her up as her mother gently wakes a sleeping child. And there was only one person in the whole world could do, do that, and he was there at that moment. It was for her sake that he didn't stay a moment long, longer at the other side of the lake of Deca, uh, Deca, De, Decapolis in the Gadarenes. When they said, please go away, one of the reasons why he went away straight away was there was a little girl seriously ill on the other side of the lake and there was no one else who could wake her up. We live in a day of substitutes, don't we? We go to the shop and we ask for something. They say, well, I'm sorry, we haven't got anything, but we got something here and it's equally as good. Some people think it's even better. It'll do just as well. Well, maybe, but there is no substitute for the work of Jesus Christ in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. He alone can make us alive when we're dead in our trespasses and sins. No substitute to him. And then, finally, notice here how he displays his victory. We're told Jesus went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kimai, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately she stood and walked around. She was around 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with great astonishment. They were completely amazed. That's the scene in the text. Mark quotes, doesn't he, the actual Aramaic words that Jesus used. Jesus and his disciples would have been able to speak Greek, but uh, their normal everyday language was Aramaic. And in this event, uh, these crucial words made such an unforgettable impression on Peter and others that whenever they told this story later, uh, sometimes to Greek non-Aramaic speaking people, they would use these words because they made such an impression upon them. And it wasn't a magic formula. It's not like an abracadabra. They are just ordinary words that you would use to wake up a child for school in the morning. Talitha kumai. There was life, the life giving power of God breaking into and working through the ordinary details of life. So we read that the Lord Jesus looked at the speechless parents and said, said to them, give her something to eat. She'd been ill, she was weak, she needed food. And Jesus got them back into that daily routine with her. But they knew that from now on, there was nothing commonplace in life. Everything was under his authority. Little girl, I say to you, get up. And the Lord raised her from her deathbed. Do you see what that says? Do you see what it's teaching you and me about the Lord Jesus? That even the realm of death is subject to the sway of Jesus Christ. That's the main truth. This miracle is a glorious sign. It signifies what he is going to do when he brings in his kingdom, in all its glory. He will raise his people. This miracle is a signpost of that certainty. Signposts are important, aren't they? But they're not the final destination. So why don't we have this sort of thing now, some people will say. Why don't we find two or three Christians being raised from the dead in Wales every year and death certificates being torn up because of it? Why don't we have that? Why don't we witness that today? Well, it's for the same reason that you don't often find it when Jesus was on earth. We've got the incident in Luke 7 and the raising of the son of the widow of Nain and there's the raising of Lazarus in John 11. And then there's this incident. And there are references to others being raised, but these are the only specific ones. So Jesus himself in his own ministry doesn't bring many back to life. Why not? Well, it's because it wasn't yet time. That is for Resurrection Day. 
That is, at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the dead shall be raised. What we have in the life of Jesus is certain samples of the way in which he will raise all in the last day. Most people who died in, during the time of Jesus' ministry stayed dead. He didn't empty cemeteries. He didn't put funeral directors out of work. He didn't make grave diggers redundant, did he, when he was on earth? There were just these few cases during his ministry in which he raised and restored the dead in order to show that the Son of God has power over the realm of death. He can plunder its captives and release them and give us courage and hope, spread hope abroad in our hearts in the face of death. The raising of the daughter of Jairus is a sign and a foretaste, a preliminary sketch, as it were, of what's to come when Jesus comes again. A foretaste. You know, when I was a lad, my mother used to make cakes, and she'd put all the ingredients into the bowl together, and she'd get a big wooden spoon, and she'd mix it all up until it had the right consistency, and then it would be put into the cake tins with greaseproof paper and into the oven, and then she'd give us the wooden spoon to lick. Sometimes it was used for other things, but on those occasions it was to lick. That was the treat. But it wasn't the real treat, was it? The real treat came a couple of hours later, when those warm cakes, sprinkled with icing, was put onto the table. The wooden spoon was a foretaste of the real treat to come. That's the way this miracle works. And the other miracles in the Gospels, they give hope to the people of God. It gave a special hope, I think, to James, the apostle. We know about Peter, don't we? We know all about John. They, they lived long lives. They were mightily used in preaching and writing. But James is almost anonymous to us as one of the disciples and apostles. He wrote nothing. There's no record of his preaching for us to read. But he's with Christ here on this occasion. And he was with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he was with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't know much about James. Why? Well, it's because a year or two later, Herod took him and cut off his head. He was the first apostle to die for Jesus. And the Savior very kindly gave him this foretaste of glory in the home of Jairus and on the Mount of Transfiguration. Here's the mightiest miracle of the four that Mark records for us in these two chapters. Illness and demon possession and the calming of the storm. They were wonderful, that was one thing. But dying. And then someone entering the realm of the dead and bringing them back is something else altogether. And that's what Jesus does. That is his promise in John 6, verse 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. That's the promise. And if you say that's too good to be true, and you ask whoever heard of anyone being raised from the dead, I say that today you have. I've just told you about it. And you might say Mark is obviously prejudiced against uh, or prejudiced in favor of Jesus. But I say to you that the gospel writers, when they write these amazing things that Jesus did, were writing in the first century. When there were all manner of people running around who knew the truth about whether Jesus had done these things in Galilee and Jerusalem. If Mark was feeding us a pack of lies here, then that would have been exposed in no time. People would have said he was a con man. And Christianity would be exposed as a fraud and there would never be any chapels in Wales or anywhere else. Do I believe this record? Yes, I do, because there's good reason to believe the record. It sounds fantastic, but it's true. This is what happens when the Son of God walks upon the face of the earth and amongst men. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus, the risen Lord, says, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Keys are a symbol of control and authority, and Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades. You might have a key to an office, 
or to a bank deposit box, or to a summer cottage, or a sports car, or the flat that your mistress lives in. But you don't have the key to death and the grave. Only Jesus Christ holds that key. He's the one who controls it. And he can say to death, when, when it may close its jaws upon someone, and he can say to death, now open those jaws and release them, and death will obey him. And that's why his people can rest in him. And we've got an example of that here. You see, the hopelessness of the mourners and the pessimism of the servants of Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why bother him any more? What utter despair. But Jesus gives life in the face of death. It is not hopeless. There is a Savior who has conquered death. And Jairus' little daughter, playing in the street with her friends, will tell you that death cannot put you beyond the grasp of Jesus. This same God, the God who raised Jairus' daughter in the presence of witnesses, says today, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Well, is there? Is there any sin too hard for him to forgive? Any difficulty he can't deal with? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And so what we see in this text is a kind and a mighty Saviour. I don't know why you wouldn't want him to be your own saviour. Why wouldn't you long to have him? Why would anyone want to reject him? I can't understand that. Except that he tells us that we love darkness rather than the light. Andrew Boner was once talking to a Christian lady who told her, him that he, she had lost the fear of death by thinking about those words from Revelation chapter 1 that I hold the keys of death and Hades. Her reasoning was this. If Jesus has the key of death, then when the gate of death opens for me, the first face I shall see will be his. Now Jairus' daughter wouldn't be able to express her hope in that way, I guess. This little girl eventually died again. She had been dead, Jesus brought her back to life, but that wasn't final resurrection life for her, and so later she died again. Perhaps she lived many years. We don't really know, do we? Perhaps she saw her father, Jairus, die, and her mother, and she saw them both buried. And later she died, and her dust now lies somewhere in Galilean soil today. But I wonder if on her dying bed she assured her friends that she had lost her fear of death ever since she was 12 years old. She left that fear with Jesus long ago and she would say, the first hand I'll feel will be his and the first voice I'll hear will be his saying, little girl, I say to you, arise. What a glorious saviour. Why don't you come and put your trust in him tonight? Lord bless his word to us.